So, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's uh, public lecture, which I'm sure will be uh, exceptional because the subject matter is so fantastic. This is about an ex uh, experiment which uh, captured stardust from a falling star shooting through space, which has now been brought down uh, to Earth for study here at Slack and at other places. I remember from my boyhood, my mother singing to me the whole time a song saying, catch a falling star, put it in your pocket, save it for a rainy day. And this is just what Sean and his colleagues have done. They've caught it. Rainy days are kind of short in supply at the moment, but come the fall, I'm sure we'll get some rain and we can get back to uh, experiments on this. Sean, of course, is a very well-known physicist. He did his doctorate here at Stanford in material sciences. And he's now a staff uh, physicist here at the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation uh, Laboratory. After this talk, um, please stay because we can offer you an irresistible cocktail of cookies and physicists that <laughs> outside. We have uh, quite a few physicists who will be there. They've all got badges on saying, ask a physicist, don't hesitate. Uh, you'll recognize them anyway because physicists just look that little bit different from the, <laughs> the uh, um, you know, please hang around. And if you've got any questions, as always, Sean will be happy to answer them for you, but also we've got people outside uh, as well. Uh, just before we start, I'd just like to draw your attention to the safety notice that be aware of the exits. There are exits here, there, and to at the top. Um, if there's a fire and emergency, then just follow us out to the building. There's two assembly areas, one out that way and one out this way. That if there's an earthquake, remain in the building, duck cover, evacuate the building to the assembly areas, which are the same as I've mentioned. Stay away from windows. I think we'll be okay. <laughs> and down power lines. Uh, in the event of the emergency, dial 9 and then 911 on any of these phones uh, or from your cell phone, and our address is uh, marked there. Um, so, just in case. After that little reminder, I'd like to ask uh, Sean to come forward and give his talk. So, welcome, Sean, please. Sean back. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited to be given this opportunity to tell you about my research. Um, this is, at some level, it's the culmination of a seven-year process of, of uh, the, the satellite Stardust leaving Earth, going out, collecting material, coming back. At the same time, it's the beginning of a much longer process of analyzing the material we've brought back. So I hope I can explain both of those things. What we're trying to do with Stardust is to answer some really fundamental questions about how our solar system got to be where it is. So, how did our solar system form? Or more specifically, what are the starting conditions of our current solar system is really what we're trying to ask. Now, some, some, just some, some useful reference points, if you will. The, the age of our solar system is about four and a half billion years, okay? That's, you know, reasonably long time. But compared to the age of the universe, which is more like 13 billion years, there was some time between the Big Bang and when our solar system formed. And we, we are going to have a real challenge knowing, getting the entire timeline between 13 and four and a half billion years ago. But we can tell you a few things about it. And what we know is somewhere in the neighborhood, there was a star that got too big for its britches and it turned into a supernova. You didn't hear it because it was in vacuum. But here's what a supernova looks like. This was supernova 1987A, so it happened about 20 years ago. It actually happened about 170,000 years ago, but we only heard about it 20 years ago because that's when the light actually got to us. So this is kind of a, a is, do I need to lower the lights a little? Let me see if I can, uh, uh, there, there, there. How's that, that better? Cool, okay. So in this field of view, you have two 
stars that haven't done anything foolish. And here is the remnant of supernova 1987a. And then if you look, there are actually three rings. And because we're looking at it from far away, they pancake together into what seems to be these sort of interlocking rings. But it's actually, we think that, that basically this ring is in our direction, that ring is in the other direction, and this is the ring halfway between the two. And there are all sorts of interesting theories about maybe there's a, it's a jet which is precessing and all sorts of, it's, it's uh, from everything I've, I've understood, they don't really understand what's going on here, but they knew it definitely was a supernova. Now, why do I know that a supernova happened in our neighborhood? Well, the reason I know is that the Big Bang basically generates relatively low Z elements, elements without many protons. So things like hydrogen, helium, beryllium, things like that. A, a, a typical star like our sun produces a few more elements out to say oxygen, still not very many. In order to produce the iron that's in your blood, that's the hemoglo in the hemoglobin molecule, you need a supernova, okay? It's the only way to get it, right? The lead we use for shielding, the gold that's on your wedding band, all of those heavy elements were produced in a supernova. So that's how we know that one of these guys was in the neighborhood, okay? So that's the first thing we know. We then know that sometime after that, there was this big dusty cloud called a nebula, and it was in the nebula that our star formed. Now, this is a photo of another star producing region. It's called RCW 38. And if you were to look at this region with visible light photons, you wouldn't see anything because that cloud of dust is really thick, okay? You just can't see through it. But what you see here is in the infrared. Now, infrared is a different wavelength light. It's actually a longer wavelength. And the best way to think about infrared is, is if you feel sort of a fireplace from across the, the, the room, that radiant heat, that's infrared. Or the, the sun, even through a window, you'll feel that radiant heat. That's infrared, okay? So basically what we've got is a heat map of this cloud, okay? And what we're seeing here is that, in fact, there are all of these newly born stars that haven't gotten bright enough to be seen in the visible yet, but are warm enough to be felt in the infrared, okay? So that's the next step. You, you blow up a star, and then you start condensing new stars out of that nebular cloud. Now, the next step in the process is what's called a protoplanetary disk, okay? And so basically that cloud, it first collapses into a disk. And what we're looking at is this disk is now edge on. And basically at the center of this disk is the star. And you can see the sunlight from that star above and below this center. But in the center region, there's just so much dirt and protoplanets and, and dust and things that you don't see the light from that region. So that's that's what a protoplanetary disk looks like, is that it's sort of the absence of light in this region. Now, these are sort of interesting things. These are called jets, and basically it has to do with as you collapse the dust into a disk, you start to develop angular momentum and magnetic fields, and what you have here is an outflow of material at the center of this whirling system, okay? So, this is... HH30, again, this is something that was, was uh, seen by the Hubble telescope. Most of these photos are, are Hubble telescope photos. And let's see. I have sort of a, an analog for that whole planet-forming situation right here with, with um, Saturn. And, and you probably have seen photos of Saturn, and with a decent telescope, you can see Saturn. It has rings such as these, but it also has a series of moons farther out, at, at farther distances from Saturn. And basically, at, at the, in early times, Saturn was just one big disk of dust, okay? 
But Rhea out there started collecting all the dust in its neighborhood, in its path, right? Gathering it up and turning it into a, into a moon, and so on with these other moons. And then down here, in the, it, close to, to Saturn, those basically, because they're so close to the, to the planet, they are not able to collect themselves into a single body, okay? Now, the difference between this situation and the, our own solar system is basically the reverse. That in our case, the rings are out here. And notice that even with Saturn, there is still dust in the path of these guys. So I suspect if we came back in a few hundred million years, these things would e be even bigger than they are now. Um, but, but so what we have now is this idea of, again, of a protoplanetary disk where ultimately we form very close to the sun a series of, of now only eight planets, it turns out. I don't know if you heard the news. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then, well, they've, they've been dwarf planet, what kind of a name? I, I'd get a PR man if I were them. Uh, but so, so eight planets, um, and then out beyond those eight planets is something called the Kuiper Belt. And, okay, so let's talk about where, where, where's the Kuiper Belt? Okay, so um, this, <laughs> I, I started out uh, my, my physics career thinking that AU meant atomic units. I'm now dealing with astronomical units. It's the same AU, but a uh, different length scale. So an, an astro see, I'm going to do this. An astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the Earth, 93 million miles. Or so, so for physicists, that's like 100 million miles. So 50 AU is like 5 billion miles, OK? Well, how do, we, how do we get a grasp of what 5 billion miles is? Okay, so let's say that a mile were only an inch long, okay? Well, I'd have to go around the Earth three times an inch at a time in order to get to 5 billion inches, okay? So that gives you a sense of how far away 5 billion miles is. It's a ways out there. Jupiter, by the way, is only about five astronomical units out. So it's practically our next door neighbor. Okay, now, the Kuiper Belt is the source of what they call short period comets, okay? What's interesting about these short period comets is that we're pretty sure that the Kuiper Belt is the remnants of this protoplanetary disk that are essentially unaffected by the fact that the sun has turned on and turned into this huge fusion reaction, okay? And so if we could go out there and snag a comet from the Kuiper Belt, we think we would have material which is pristine, which is a leftover, frozen out there in the deep freeze of, of space piece of that protoplanetary disk, okay? That's the goal. Now, there are a couple ways to do that. You can send a mission out there and look at it out there, or you can bring the material back. And I'm a real fan of bringing the material back. But let's talk a little bit about sample return missions. Some of you, similarly gray hair, may remember the Apollo program. I, you know, I was a teenager during the Apollo program, and it, it was pretty darn exciting, I have to admit. So uh, the last one was Apollo 17. They brought back 240 pounds of moon rocks, uh, an amazing collection of stuff. Um, now, at the same time, I should point out that, that in 06 dollars, that was a $135 billion program. So a decent chunk of change for that uh, set of missions. Um, but it was a very exciting time. What I hadn't appreciated until I started working on this is that the Soviets, in 1976, did a sample return mission from the moon. It was called Luna 24. And they brought back about six ounces of lunar soil. Um, they, what they did was they had a little sort of robot arm that drilled into the soil and collected it and stored it in this package here. And then it launched back and landed back on Earth. Very cool. I mean, when you think about the state of computers in 1976, the state of robots in 1976, this was a real tour de force. Um, and in fact, afterwards, we traded some of our moon rocks for some of their moon rocks. So it, it's cool. Somewhere in, in, in Houston, there's, there's some, we have some of uh, the Luna 24 uh, samples. 
Okay, so 240 pounds, six ounces, stardust. We're bringing back about <laughs> two <laughs> nano pounds <laughs> or a microgram of material. Well, <laughs> what's the point? The real point, <laughs> the real point is that our analytical capabilities have gotten so much better. You know, as a, a colleague of mine said, you know, they brought the moonwalks back and they took a hammer out and started pounding on them. You know, <laughs> that was what you did in 1976. Whereas now, as I am hoping I'll show you, we, we, we are able to look at a nanogram piece of cometary material and tell you all sorts of things about it. So, um, <laughs> believe me, it's worth it, bringing back that microgram. Let me tell you a little about the, the bus. Um, this is the sample return capsule that, uh, where the, the, the samples are collected, and, and, and this is the only thing that's going to come back to Earth. The rest of it is still out there in space. Um, other things, that's a, an antenna that they use for communicating uh, back, uh, you know, phoning home. Um, these are the solar panels. They're all nicely folded up, but when, they, when it gets out into space, the, the panels will open up and collect uh, energy from the sun, and that's how they power the, the satellite. Notice the uh, change <laughs> in mission costs. This is part of the Discovery series. And um, so I frankly think we're getting a real, a real uh, great budget mission uh, for a mere $200 million. Um, okay, mission dates are February uh, 99 to January 06, and as I hope I'll show you, extended beyond that dramatically. Okay, so why do we want to go out, all the way out to the Kuiper Belt, to get this material? The problem is, as soon as you turn on a fusion reaction, everything is changed by that fusion reaction, right? So the sun, the, our, our, our local, only, it's only 93 million miles away, fusion reaction, basically is homogenizing and changing all of the stuff that's local, okay? So all of the meteorites that have landed, for the most part, are due to things which are really quite close to uh, the Earth's orbit, sort of within three or four uh, astronomical units. So if we can reach out and get some of that stuff from farther out into space, uh, we, can, we can be more confident that it is, in fact, material that hasn't been altered by the solar processes, okay? So, that's easy. You just get in a spaceship, go out beyond the orbit of Jupiter, snag a comet, bring it back, no problem. Well, there's this minor astronomical unit problem that we have to deal with. So, even better, we let Jupiter do the heavy lifting for us. How do we do that? Okay, so, Here's poor Comet Vilt 2. Uh, Comet Vilt 2 is called Vilt 2 because Peter Vilt, who is a Swiss astronomer, it was the second comet he discovered, so it's Vilt 2. <laughs> um, it spent the last four and a half billion, uh, billion years hanging out in the Kuiper Belt, minding its own business, and in 1974, it had a close encounter with Jupiter. And when that happened, its orbit completely changed, and suddenly, it's what they call a short period comet. So since, oops, since 1974, it's had an orbit where out here it's beyond the orbit of Jupiter, but it also comes down to within the, or the, uh, between the orbits of Earth and Mars, okay? And so rather than having to go all the way out here to snag it, we can snag it right there. Now, why is Vilt 2 important to us. It's because it's only been down into the near, the, the close solar system only five times in the past four and a half billion years, right? So we're getting the advantage of, of, of a comet which is very close to being pristine protoplanetary comet material, but we don't have to go all the way out there. Uh, let's see. While I'm here, let me, let me remind you that the comet tail is basically pointing away from the sun, okay? And first of all, when it's out here, there's no tail because the solar radiation isn't creating a tail. It's really the, the solar radiation which causes the tail to form. And so, as it's in this region, the tail is pointing out in this direction, and then it, it, the tail slowly rotates, and then we'll 
get smaller and smaller as it goes back out you know, into its outer orbit. Okay, so that's where the tail comes from. Okay, a photo of our friend Comet Vil2, sort of potato shaped, um, and it's about four miles in the long axis, and I don't know half that in the short axis. This this uh, photo was taken from a roughly 150 miles away by uh, one of the telescopes that was on the Stardust uh, satellite. So that's what we're looking at. So how do we get that photo? Well, you have to build and launch the satellite that intercepts the tail. This is the real challenge. How do we collect the dust coming off of that comet as gently as possible? Because, you know, if we, if we alter it during the collection process, well, we, we, we messed up somehow. Another challenge, returning it safely to Earth, but then, having done those three, this is the, the good part. We get to use all of this, this huge facility here to measure, to study the particles we brought back. Okay, so the, the primary people who started the mission are NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Lockheed Martin, and the University of Washington. Don Brownlee is the PI from the University of Washington. I'm part of a BAPAC consortium consisting of uh, Stanford University, uh, UC Berkeley, and the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, okay? Now, we're, I'm gonna talk about results here at the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory, but to give you a flavor of who all else is involved, these are the other three synchrotron light facilities here in the US, and they've also been very much involved in the an analysis of Stardust materials. And similarly, Spring 8 is a, a synchrotron facility in Japan, and the ESRF is a, it's called the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, facility. that's in, in Grenoble, in France. So all of these facilities are involved in the analysis of these materials. And again, that's the great thing about a sample return mission, is that you can have many uh, researchers, uh, I think at, at last count it was well over 100, from lots of different countries, all involved in the research. So, uh, February 7th, 99, uh, Delta rocket, um, something like 900,000 pounds of thrust, I don't remember all the details. Um, these are the solid rocket boosters that are strapped onto the outside, and then it's basically a liquid-fueled rocket in the center. The satellite sitting up there in this uh, cone there. Beautiful, safe launch. Um, let's, let's spend a little time on this. Okay, so it's basically a three billion mile journey that the, the uh, the, the satellite w underwent in order to bring, get, go out there, intercept, and bring it back. So let's walk through this. We start out launch uh, February of 99. We go out on this red orbit, and then two years later, approximately, uh, 115 of 01, we get a gravity assist. Basically, as it comes back around, it's, it, it feels the gravity of the Earth and slingshots around, and that changes its orbit. So the green orbit, and it goes all the way around again, and then in, in three years later now, um, 2nd of January 04, is where it intercepts the comet here, and then finally the blue orbit brings it back and lands on Earth last January, January 15th of 06. So, Two billion miles to get to the comet and another billion miles to come home with the goodies. Um, artist's conception of uh, what it potentially looked like um, uh, as it was passing through the tail of the comet. Again, here's the, the uh, sample re recovery vehicle, SRV, or sometimes just called reentry vehicle. Here, I'm gonna talk about this in, in a little bit. This is, I'm, I'm gonna just, we'll call it the tennis racket, just for, you know, sort of, it looks like a tennis racket up there. Uh, again, the, 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 the unfolded uh, solar panels, um, the antenna that, that uh, is used to talk to Earth. These are what they call Whipple shields, and basically the concern is you don't wanna damage either the solar panels or the antenna with all the particles coming off. So you have these sort of protective shields out in front 
Um, whereas, notice we, we don't have shields for the, for the tennis racket because that's where we want to collect uh, the, the cometary material. Um, about three minutes in the tail, uh, roughly 150 miles separation. You know, there's this tricky game, right? You get, if you're too close to the comet during the intersection, you could run into you know, a Volkswagen-sized uh, boulder and that would be the end of the satellite. If you're too far away from the comet, you may not get as many particles as you'd like. So there's sort of this tricky balance, and it was not until several days before uh, the actual uh, flyby that they, they decided on, a, uh, on this particular uh, separation. So um, this is the tennis racket. Um, distance here is mm, about 16 inches. Uh, there are about 130 of these um, rectangular blocks of aerogel. And so this is perhaps just under two inches wide by a little over an inch tall and similarly a little over an inch deep, uh, each of these blocks. And the idea is to collect the particles in these blocks of aerogel. There are also, by the way, there's, there are pieces of aluminum foil separating the blocks, and they will also see impacts from the cometary material. And I'll, I'll show you uh, some of those results as well. Uh, aluminum frame, all very lightweight. Um, so let's talk a little bit about aerogel. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, it's, it's, uh, what you do is you take some sand and you dissolve it in things like alcohol and ammonia, and you end up with something that has, sort of has a consistency of jello, right? Sort of jiggles there and, and uh, it's very wet. But then what you do is you, you put it in a, in a vacuum box. Uh, actually, it's elevated pressure, so it's sort of the opposite of a vacuum box. It's sort of a, uh, it's sort of a bomb, actually, because you're heating it up and, and you're putting pressure on it. And by doing that, you, you get rid of the alcohol and the ammonia, and you end up with, with basically this cast object, which is the jello after you've removed all the liquids. So it's a solid. Um, and it's just this incredibly low-density solid. It's, it's um, uh, basically, it, it's 3% of the density of water. Now, um, how do I, uh, let's see, I, I think, I, I, there, it's tough to give you a good analogy for this one, but supposedly if, if there was a block of aerogel as big as me, it would weigh about a pound. <laughs> So it's, it's, more, it, it's less dense than I am, let me put it that way. Um, so, but it's actually strong, right? I mean, here, here's a, a, a house brick, so, and, and this piece of aerogel is supporting that entire house brick. So it's, it's, it actually is quite robust. It's sort of like firm styrofoam. Um, one of the attributes people say for it is, is like solid smoke, because it, it, it really does sort of almost look like it would blow away if, if uh, you turned your head. Um, some, some other really interesting properties of it. It's an extremely good insulator. Uh, as, you, as you see here, we're trying to melt these poor crayons by heating up with a blowtorch, and the crayons are just sitting there happy as clams because the, 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 can't just, the heat won't transfer through this, uh, the aerogel. Uh, so a bunch of interesting properties. It's, it's been used um, on some other missions where you have um, very cold liquids that, that you're going to send up into space and you'd like to keep them very cold, you'll put an aerogel blanket around them. Uh, and it w actually works very well for that purpose as well. Now, the reason we're using it is not for its thermal properties, but because the relative velocity between the satellite and the comet is 13,000 miles an hour. Okay? Uh, what's 13,000 miles an hour? That's pretty darn fast. Um, Let's see, uh, Mach 1, approximately 800 miles an hour. I don't think you get to Mach 17. It doesn't make any sense at that point, right? But it's, so it's a lot faster than the fastest jet we have. Uh, and so the challenge is to try and have these little bitty particles decelerate sufficiently slowly that they don't just melt as soon as they hit the, the top surface of the aerogel. And so by having this very, very low density material, we're able to have them slow down slowly, gradually, and, and lose their energy through a whole series of decelerations into this very low density material. Now, 
What happens when they run into the aluminum foil that's next to the aerogel? It looks like a crater. Basically, what you've done is you've just dumped a whole bunch of energy into one spot right now. And instead of having a nice intact uh, piece of cometary material, you have what we call impact residue. <laughs> and, you know, there's some things you can learn about uh, cometary material from impact residue, but it's a different set of experiments. And, um, You'd hate to have this as your only way of learning about the materials. So um, it's good we have both, uh, but, but definitely the aerogel is an improvement over uh, the aluminum foil. And obviously, that wasn't, <laughs> we knew this was going to be what, what it was. Um, OK, so that, that pie shaped reentry vehicle uh, is basically the only thing that came back. And it came back fast. It came back at 28,000 miles an hour, which is a lot faster than, say, the shuttle reentry. And that's basically because there are no humans involved. So the, 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 the deceleration Gs that this capsule can, can handle are much higher than, than uh, what, say, uh, humans can handle. Uh, so this is basically our, own, our very own um, meteor, as it were, <laughs> coming across the night sky. It was landed in Utah last January um, in the middle of the night. Just happened to be that was where the sun was when, when the satellite uh, ran into the Earth. So it was in the middle of the night. We don't have a photo of this next thing. because So this is sort of an artist's rendition, artist rendition of what happens after it's, slow, it's finally gotten slow enough that it can then deploy a parachute and then happily descend down to the Utah desert. And just before it lands, it cuts the cord here. So at the last two feet or so, it thump onto the Utah soil. And here we see it finally landed on the soil. And you see that, that in fact, it sort of rolled around a bit after it landed. Here are the, the remnants, of the, the straps that, that held the parachute on. I don't know if you remember, I should have pointed this out. This uh, is the nose cone that was white when we launched it <laughs> and has turned sort of grayish uh, during the reentry process. All that heat has been turned into a bladed shield. Okay? So I can't tell you how happy we were to see this photo. I mean, this, is, this was just a huge, huge success for us. And the reason is that 18 months before, <laughs> We had a different event. This is the Genesis mission. And um, it had what they call a hard landing. Um, basically, <laughs> the parachute didn't deploy. And there's a really interesting reason why. Very clever, these, these, these NASA people. Basically, they put an accelerometer into the reentry vehicle so that as soon as it started being decelerated by the atmosphere, the accelerometer would be triggered and it would say, oh, I'm in the atmosphere, time to deploy the, the parachute. Perfect. The problem is they installed the accelerometer the wrong way. <laughs> they installed it backwards and so it just kept saying, hey, <laughs> I'm ready, I'm ready, and splat. Now, the good news is that we recovered uh, most of the samples on this mission, despite the fact that it landed at something like 200 miles an hour. Um, and, and we've actually been doing some, st uh, some research on these samples as well. As, as I like to tell people, the worst case scenario is where it bounces off the upper atmosphere and keeps going. <laughs> that we can't do anything about. This we can do a lot about. But even better is, is that. That's really, really good. So after that, we brought it back to Houston. And here's our tennis racket now beautifully clean in the lab. Here's a bunch of, of physicists acting like kids. I mean, they're like, oh, look at that. I mean, talk about scientific method. Look at that. Uh, it was, <laughs> you know, but they're all nicely cleaned up because we don't want to get it dirty and all these things. But, but you know, they're still basically a bunch of kids. Um, and <laughs> so then, of course, you know, the press had a field day. You're bringing dust back? Uh, so... <laughs> We had a little trouble with that, but <laughs> uh, we hope that we'll be able to explain that, no, this the dust was really, <laughs> it was a good thing. Um, <laughs> so 
here is one of those tiles, they call them, the, these rectangular blocks of aerogel. And so this is a macroscopic, this is sort of four centimeters across, and look at the size of that, that track. I mean, this is a, I don't know, five millimeter diameter track that some particle caused <laughs> in the aerogel. So um, we have, as it turns out, a range of sizes that, that landed in the aerogel, uh, and this is certainly one of, the, one of the larger ones. But then the terminal particle is way down here, and, and, and you can't see it in this particular uh, photo. So that was what they were looking at, was, was, was tracks like that where you could, you know, with the naked eye, you could say, oh my goodness, there's a, <laughs> there's a track. If you look at them more closely, you can see that they, they, the tracks vary all over the map, but generally, okay, first of all, the direction of travel is from, left, from right to left. So the particle came into the aerogel right here, and something happened. <laughs> And you see that there are all these sort of tracks. I mean, some of these are just sort of shockwave fractures in the aerogel. But there's clearly lots of material in here. There's probably more material here. Here's, you know, you sort of have a blow up here. There's a couple of particles here. And then if we blow up this region here, there are a whole series of particles along here. And then finally, sort of last man standing is what we call the terminal particle, okay? So, we have this, this um, it's clearly some kind of a cluster that has struck this surface of the, of the comet, and parts of it have, have remained in this region, other parts have gotten all the way out to the end. And what we need to do is we need, in order to understand what is Comet Vilt 2 made of, we have to figure out all of the material that's in this, in this track, okay? So, what we need to do is we, have to, we start out, of course, that big macroscopic block, and then we have to sort of cut it down to where we can work with it. And what we use is, uh, this is what we call a keystone, and it's about three millimeters uh, in its long dimension. And this, again, still holds the entire track within it, but now there's much less aerogel around it, so we can start to look at the particles that are inside there without having all this excess material around. So, great, I've got my keystone, it's got a perfect track in there, what do I do now? Okay, so there's something called the preliminary examination team, which is these hundred researchers from a dozen countries, and they've got more acronyms than you can shake a stick at. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is the X-ray microprobe work that we're doing here at uh, SLAC, but uh, there are a variety of other techniques as well. The reason why the X-ray microprobe is so useful for this preliminary examination is that what we're able to do is determine the major and trace elements within the particles without having to extract the particles from the tracks, okay? And this is a real benefit for trying to get this sort of big picture view of just what do we got, right? So we can determine how much is deposited along the track versus how much is in that, that particle that's out there at the end. And lastly, it's non-destructive. So after I'm done with my work, I can then send it on to someone else who says, okay, I wanna look at that particle and I'm gonna pick that particle out and I'm gonna look at it, right? And, and nothing I've done will affect what they're gonna about to do. So it's a very good preliminary examination tool. So why do I need all of these tools? Well, you know, the old story about the blind man and the elephant, right? The one blind man, he, he's holding on to the trunk. He says, oh my God, and it's a snake, right? And then there's some guy over here, he says, well, it feels more like a rope to me, right? And then there's some guy holding on to a tusk saying, uh-oh, we're in trouble now, right? But when you add all these stories together, you start to say, oh, I know what kind of beast this is. So that's the idea with all these different techniques is, is, to, is to be able to give you a fuller picture. There, any one technique is only going to give you a subset of all the information. So, X-ray microprobes. Here is a view of SLAC you may not have seen before. This is Interstate 280 running along here, the foothills up there, um, and the two mile long electron accelerator right here. In case you're wondering where you are, you are here. <laughs> this is the Panofsky Auditorium right here. Sand Hill Road is out here. 
And the research that we've been doing is done at a new facility called Spear 3. Well, it's a rebuilt facility called Spear 3, uh, recently rebuilt only about two years ago. And it is here in what's called the research yard. There are several different facilities in this area. I should mention, by the way, that, that we are now in, just beginning the process of building something called a free electron laser using the last third of the LINAC. And that facility is going to end up over here. So we're continually, it's sort of like the old story of grandfather's axe. You know, oh, this is grandfather's axe. Well, my dad replaced the head and I've replaced the handle a couple of times, but it's still grandfather's axe, right? Anyway, <laughs> uh, Spear 3 is um, now this, this um, oval-shaped uh, facility here. The electrons are accelerated around this oval, and the x-rays produced by the electrons come off in these tangential arcs away from the electrons. And so in these buildings here are the beam lines that are uh, where we do our experiments. Now, you may be wondering, why do I have to come to Slack to do my work? Why can't I just build my own laboratory and do work on these cometary materials? That's a good question. The synchrotron is very much different from a standard X-ray source. And I'm going to use the, the, an, an, the analogy of a standard X-ray source is sort of like a standard light bulb. It's radiating in all directions, okay? Everywhere, you, know, you have a certain amount of power that you've put into the light bulb, and it's going out everywhere. Whereas the synchrotron is much more like this laser here, where you put in a certain amount of power, and it's all coming out, zap, right there, in a very parallel beam, very intense parallel beam. And there are things you can do with a very intense parallel beam that are just that much harder to do with this 4 pi radiator, we call them, this light bulb-like thing. Now, there are some properties of lasers that, that our synchrotron doesn't do, and the new free electron laser will do. So um, the, the analogy doesn't work perfectly, but it's much closer to being like a laser than it is like this. And that's why we're using uh, slack for our, for our work. Ah, your friend, the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, you may not be aware of all the varieties of light out there, um, but they vary all over the map. Starting sort of down where you, you may have heard AM radio, well, it's got a wavelength of about a soccer field. It's, you know, a hundred yard wavelength, okay? That's a big photon. But it's basically the same light, all the same properties, just a lot bigger, that is up here in the visible region, okay? And the visible region has a, a wavelength of a micron. And I'm going to hold off and tell you what a micron is, but it's really small, okay? In between, you have things like microwave ovens, and they have wavelengths of, you know, sort of 10 centimeters or, you know, 4 inches, something like that, sort of the size of a baseball. Um, our work here at SSRL is, has, uses light which has a wavelength which is about the same size as an atom, okay? So it's really small, all right? Um, and the other way to think about light, instead of thinking in terms of wavelength, you can also think in terms of energy. And so these units are units of energy. They're called electron volts. And, and the best way to give you the anal analogy for that is that visible light is roughly one electron volt, approximately, right? And the, the, the energies that we're using is about 10,000 electron volts, okay? So quite a bit more energetic per photon than visible light, and quite a bit smaller wavelength than visible light. Okay, so how do we identify the presence of particular elements? Well, the idea is then you send x-rays in of a particular color, a color that you know, and we look for other colors coming out of the cometary samples. And by noticing what colors come out, we can identify which elements are present. Now, how does that work? Well, you know, we, we can, let's say this was an atom. It's, it's, it's got a nucleus in the center. It's got electron shells around it. And let's say I shine a photon in and I kick out one of those inner shell electrons. 
What happens then is that an outer shell electron then goes in and fills that inner shell, and a new photon, you see it just snuck out there before I could capture it, um, <laughs> a new photon drops down with a different color. Let me show you that again so you can see it again. You're going to see a photon come in, and then this electron drops down, and boom, out goes this other color, okay? And that color is specific to the difference between this shell energy and that shell energy, okay? Now, if I have a different element, then I can shine the same light going in, but because the difference between this electron and that electron is different, I'll have different energy photon coming out. So by looking at the colors of the photons coming out, I know what elements are present. And in fact, you can calculate the difference in energy between those two shells for all the elements in the periodic table, starting down here at hydrogen, going all the way up here to uranium. And remember, I was talking about electron volts. Well, this is 1,000 electron volts. And so these elements in here have energies of less than 20,000 electron volts. And up here at uranium, it's closer to 100,000 electron volts. Remember, visible light is like one volt, OK? So, and you notice there's this sort of very um, monotonic uh, change in energy. It slowly increases as you get to higher and higher uh, numbers of protons in the nucleus. OK, I, was, I promised I was going to talk to you about sizes. OK. So, Cometary particles from VILT2, it turns out, are sort of 10 microns and smaller. And in fact, some of them are quite a bit smaller. But the big ones are about 10 microns. Well, what is that? How do I, how do I, what's 10 microns? Well, there's a human hair, okay? <laughs> so cometary particles are 1 50th the size, sorry, 1 10th the size of a human hair, okay? Pretty small. So how am I gonna, how am I gonna measure that? I got an X-ray beam that's only two microns wide, okay? So I can not only just shine my electron, my X-ray beam onto that comet particle, I can shine it onto a little bitty one side of that comet particle if I need to, okay? So it's because I have that very bright synchrotron source that I can get away with having an X-ray beam that's only two microns wide, all right? But Remember, human hair, about 100 microns. So this is a very small thing that we're dealing with. Ah, the crew. Um, I should uh, mention uh, my, my colleagues, uh, Konstantin Ignatiev and Katarina Luning are both here at, at SLAC. Uh, Hope Ishi is a colleague from Lawrence Livermore. And not in this photo is my colleague, Piero Pianetta, who's out here in the audience. Um, pleasure to work with all these people, and I should also explain that when you're doing an experiment with the synchrotron, you work 24 hours a day until you're done. So basically, we'll be given, say, four days of beam time. That means four times 24, 96 hours where the machine is ours, and good luck. <laughs> so it really helps to have really good colleagues so you can take some time off and get some sleep. A uh, picture of our experimental apparatus. The sample is here uh, at the focal point of all of the interest. We have this really nice optical microscope that gives us a real-time photo of the sample we're looking at. And that little post-it there tells us where the X-ray beam is so that we, can, we know exactly where to put the sample because we know where the X-ray beam is. If we zoom in, the X-rays actually penetrate straight through this mirror and hit the sample right here. This mirror then, is, is the, the, the optical microscope sees the same view that the X-rays see. The detector for looking at those different color X-rays, the detector is right here. There's a helium shower that flows over the sample in order to reduce the background uh, signal from, from other sources. Here we have some real data from uh, one of the tracks that we've looked at. Um, first of all, the, the uh, optical image. And you, know, you remember, one of the first tracks I showed you had this sort of big turnip-like thing here at the beginning. This one is a much simpler track. There really is most of the material ended up at the terminal particle. A little bit of, let me explain this map. This is a false color map, where the redder the color, 
the more intensity there is. Okay? And what we're mapping here is the distribution of iron atoms in the track. Okay? So out here, outside of the track, there's no iron. Okay? Good news. Uh, in the track, there is some iron along the track. There is clearly a particle with some more iron. But most of the material is sitting there in the terminal particle. What I've got here now is a spectrum collected of the various spots along the track. And this is now plotting the color, if you will, of the, the light coming off the sample, the intensity of that light. The incident beam is here at 14,000 electron volts. Okay, we, we sent that in, so we know it, it, it better be out coming out as well. But then every one of these peaks is associated with some element that's present in the sample. So predominated by iron in the terminal particle. The blue curve is the terminal particle, and it's predominated by iron, but significant amounts of nickel as well. Whereas this particle here, much closer to the mouth of the track, has a very different nickel to iron ratio than the blue curve. This peak here is also an iron peak, so you can sort of ignore that and just think about this peak and this peak versus this peak and this peak. At the same time, we see lots of other elements. The aerogel is made of silicon, so we expect to see lots of silicon. Turns out there's significant amounts of bromine in the aerogel, and so that's a contaminant that we can ignore. The black curve is a spectrum from out here where we don't expect to see any cometary material. So it's with data such as these that uh, we're able to determine how much and which elements are present in the sample. Here's another much more turnip-like uh, track where I'm just going to plot for you the iron map. This is the distribution of iron. And notice in this case that you get to a point where there's basically no iron in this region of the track, and then way out here at the very end, you've got this last man standing terminal particle with a, a big chunk of iron out there. Uh, but there's much more iron distributed in this region here. Again, the blue says there's no iron in that region. The warmer the color, the more iron. And just to give you a sense of, of how long it takes to collect a spectrum like this, this, this is sort of an overnight scan. And, and this is when, when things are going really well, then by about 9, 10 in the evening, you set up this scan, you actually go home, get some rest, and then you come in at 6 in the morning and bingo, you've got your data overnight and you can go back to, to doing more collection. So this is when things are going well. Now, in addition to the X-ray microprobe data, I'm going to give you some, so just sort of a brief glimpse of some of the other work that we've uh, been doing. This is, oh, this is actually Hope Ishii's, uh, our colleague from Lawrence Livermore. This is using a secondary, a secondary electron microscope. And what we see here is, again, a false color map looking at the coincidence. So if, if various elements are coming from the same location in the sample of calcium, aluminum, and magnesium in this case, and silicon, aluminum, magnesium in this case. And so you notice that the silicon is way over here, whereas the calcium, aluminum, and magnesium are all seem to be coinciding right here. This is a backscattered electron image, just sort of giving you a sense of, of, of if you will, in, in real space, what the thing looks like. And that's, it is a big particle. This is, uh, you know, 10 or 15 microns. So a, a reasonably sized uh, particle. And this calcium aluminum inclusion, it, remember that name. I'm going to talk about that again. Um, this is now using something called a transmission electron microscope. And the cool thing about a transmission electron microscope is that we can actually look at the images of the atoms, the planes of atoms in this crystal, okay? So, so first of all, here is a real space image of the grain of material that we're looking at, and this is now about a half micron across here. This is then a, what's called a lattice image, where you're actually seeing the individual atoms in that grain. And then for those of you who are diffraction mavens, that's the diffraction pattern. But this is what's called forstrite. Um, and it's, it's uh, one of the many mineral grains that are, are actually quite common here on Earth as well. Um, I, but I want to emphasize this. In the past hundred years, we've gone from using a very good 
optical telescope to say, oh, look, there's a tail in that comet, to being able to say, oh, look, there are crystals, atoms with crystals in them coming out of that comet, okay? So I think we've done an amazing job in the last 100 years in the, in the progress of our scientific research, especially in, in the area of uh, astronomical research. So if I combine all the results and significant amount that I haven't talked about tonight, we can say a few things so far. Essentially, all of the impacts that we've seen have analyzable material, and that's great news. That's huge. We're seeing very large grains of, of sort of very recognizable minerals, such as you might see on Earth. But surprisingly, we're also seeing these things called calcium aluminum inclusions. And the interesting thing about that is that they are high temperature materials. You, you don't expect to have things like anorthite unless you've heated up your sample to about 1800 degrees F, right? You know, your oven, good oven will get you to 400 F, right? So this is pretty darn hot. And the presence of high temperature materials in Comet Ville 2 is very unexpected. Now, we've seen this sort of material in meteorites. But meteorites are from the inner solar system. They've had solar irradiation for the last four and a half billion years. So we can expect they'll have seen instances where they've gotten to these high temperatures. But, but we expected Vilt 2 to be way out there in the deep freeze, okay? So this poses a real question for us. How did these hot minerals come from what we thought was pretty much as cold as you can get and still be in the solar system? The good news is that the theorists were way ahead of us, and they've got about a half a dozen theories, right? <laughs> and at least two of them talk about material that, that was in the inner part of the solar system and managed to work its way back out to the Kuiper belt, okay? So we, what this does, if these results hold up, and remember this is still very early in the process, but if this result holds up, what it means is that the two theories that, that, cause, that have this counter flow back out to the outer part of the solar system are more probable than those which don't. And this is the great thing about science, is that I think up a theory, you give me a fact, and I have to adjust my theory. <laughs> All right, so currently we're writing up our results, and I've talked a little bit about the, the, uh, the, the composition, and the mineralogy. There are all sorts of other things that are being studied. Um, the isotopic uh, fraction, now isotope. An isotope is basically if I have the same number of protons in the nucleus, but different number of neutrons, okay? And so um, the isotopic results are going to be uh, very helpful in telling us whether there is material that didn't come from our solar system, right? The, 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 as soon as you turn on the sun, everything near the sun pretty much ends up with the same isotopic ratio. And I'm thinking about things like uh, the amount of oxygen 16, 17, and 18 in seawater is, is pretty much the same all over the world. And if we go to Mars and unfreeze some of their water, I'm willing to bet that their water is going to have the same 16, 17, 18 ratio. Whereas if we go out and grab something from another star, we're going to see a different oxygen 16, 17, 18 ratio. And that's what we're trying to do with this, is to determine whether the material in stardust has components from other stars in it. The other thing that would be very exciting is if we can identify organic molecules in the, in the cometary material. Now, people have done uh, spectroscopic measurements that say, yeah, we're pretty sure there's, there's organic molecules in there. But no one, this is the first time we've had an opportunity to drag a comet home and look at it with other tools other than spectroscopy. And so it would be very exciting if we could confirm the presence of organic molecules. But, you know, the problem is that humans are just one big organic molecule. And so we're, we, are, we, we have to be very careful about terrestrial and human contamination before we can confirm, yes, or, or, or reject the idea that there are organic molecules in, in the comet. So, it's amazing. It's been 30 years since the last solid sample return mission, and that's too long. We have to do these more often. 
But the good news is that because these are here, we've got many years ahead of us where we can take advantage of these materials. And one of the great things about sample return missions is that if my student, five years from now, thinks up a really great way of, of measuring these samples that no one ever thought of before, she can write a proposal to NASA and say, I want to study your cometary material. And they'll say, that sounds wonderful. And they'll send her some. So that's the great thing about sample return missions. And finally, stay tuned. These are very early days. We're really excited about what we've seen so far. And I'm sure they'll only get better. And thank you for listening. Yes. I cannot comment on that, no. <laughs> but what if there were? <laughs> well, uh, uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. If you're going to do the what if there were, the question is, did we find DNA? <laughs> 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 and I could answer that question, but then I'd have to kill all of you. So I can't answer that question either. But it would be very surprising. <laughs> Yes. Well, it's, that's a, it's a real challenge. I mean, the good news is that when, as long as they're still encased in the aerogel, they're reasonably well protected. The, the aerogel, as you saw, I mean, it can support a brick. So it's, it's not this sort of soft, gooey material, right? Um, the organics people, basically, no one gets to touch the samples the organics people are looking at. And, and they have a whole series of, of mechanisms they use to protect their samples in ways that are, are, you know, thank goodness I don't have to do that because that's a real challenge. But for us, basically, we've developed techniques so that, so as long as they're in the aerogel, it's pretty obvious what's, uh, air, what's cometary material and what isn't. And then once they're extracted, there, there are techniques that where you can where you can look at the material around it, and, and there are certain signatures that say, "Oh yes, this was definitely cometary material." Yes. Cosmic ray, for instance. You know, I'm not aware of that. Um, I know that, for instance, in the moon rocks, they saw cosmic rays because they were sitting there. Yeah. And, but, you know, cosmic rays, that's predominantly due to the solar wind, right? So we're hoping <laughs> that because this has spent all its time out in the Kuiper belt, that you wouldn't see much in the way of, of cosmic rays. But I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't actually know that. Yes? Where was the satellite launch? Oh, um, it was launched at Cape Canaveral in Florida. Yeah. Yes. Um, I hope this question makes sense because I'm not a physicist. But um, the goal was to go way out there. Yes. So you don't get things that you can find on your planet that is inside. Yes. So a few related questions. What do we know about what happened on the way? So when it comes closer to Earth, could it be that what we're looking at is different than what it looked like when we were out there? The second related Yes. Could it be that we went all the way out there just to retrieve something that we could have thought was there? Well, you don't know until you do the experiment, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, 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 that's the, the, I mean, you could say, gee, why did we do it? I mean, it's just like the stuff we've got here. Um, but, uh, so, so I think I, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with why we did it. The question of how altered is this material because it has spent at least five or six orbits near the, near the sun. And the answer is that, that um, we don't think it has changed very much. Um, uh, clearly, 
it's, it, when it's close to the sun, material is ablating off. I mean, that's what that, the tail is, is basically ablated material because of the solar radiation. You know, I forgot to mention, Comet Halley, for instance, has been around the sun at least 100 times, you know, in close into us, right? So there's one where you'd say, well, you know, that's probably had too many trips close to the sun, and so we can't really trust the material. Um, but but with, with VILT-2, because it's only had five orbits, we can, you know, it's a trade-off. I mean, obviously, you'd love to be able to get in your time machine, go out to the Kuiper Belt, grab it, bring it back, and, and here it is, folks. Um, so it's, it, you know, it's a trade-off. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir? Well, we hope to. We hope to learn more about that. That's, that's certainly the goal. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of, it's like a time capsule, isn't it? it it's like, here was this material that was hanging around, and we think it was left over from, from uh, the last supernova. Yeah, yeah. And it's just been sitting out there. It's like in the deep freeze. You know how, how I, I, I'm, I, I hope you've seen someone else's freezer where there's all sort of, sort of frost and stuff around the, the bag of vegetables. <laughs> it's someone else's freezer, not, not your own, but someone else's. Well, <laughs> basically, that's what, that's what these things look like, way out there, right? There's just this, this sort of this fuzzy snowball with, with crud and things in it, right? And so it's this, like, time capsule that's just been sitting there waiting for someone to reach out and grab it. I'm sorry, the launch date was your birthday. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, I have, I have uh, two questions. First of all, if you're worried about minerals that you form at 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, this stuff came out of a supernova. Why did that fall? Yeah, and, and so that's one of the questions is, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the question is, if it came out of a supernova, it probably got hotter than 1800 F, so what's the big deal? Of course you would expect that. And, and and the answer is that we think that w when it came out of the supernova, it, it, was, it was so hot and it was dispersing so rapidly that it didn't have a, a ch yeah, it would just be, it would be individual atoms at that point. And, and the problem is it goes out and out and gets less and less dense, less and less dense. And finally, it's cooled down enough, but, you know, there's no dance partner, <laughs> right? That's the problem. You know, I haven't focused on the interstellar dust, so I don't know the answer to that question. I, 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 I can make something up if you'd like, but okay. <laughs> yes? Uh, you showed this energy spectrum. Are yeah. Those, are those uh, two planetary energy levels? Well, if, uh, okay, so, so that's the, yeah, sure. He asks, is that the, for the, the energy spectrum that I showed, is that the first ionization potential? Is that what the question? It's actually, it's sort of the last ionization potential. It's the, it's the difference between the electron which is closest to the nucleus and the next electron out, okay? So in, there's a, a, a 1s shell, which is the electrons that are most tightly bound, and then there's a 2s shell around that, and then a 2p shell around that. And what we're looking at is the difference between the 2p electron and the 1s electron, okay? So the first ionization is sort of, it's the M shell or the L, you know, the, those out there. Does that answer your question? KEV. Oh, KEV. Yeah. No, it was, it was, yeah, it was 20, it's roughly 10 kilo electron volts. Yes. Sir. How can the rate of data um, for this mission, for the Star Trek mission, compare with the previous mission, the stuff that you recovered? Oh, okay, so Genesis, Genesis was actually a solar wind mission, okay? So in that case, what they did is they, they parked a satellite out in one of the Lagrange points, and they're just looking at the atoms coming off of the sun, 
Okay, so these are, these are individual atoms that they're depositing into materials on the satellite, okay? So that's why we talk about a solid sample return mission. The other one was sort of a, if you will, an atomic sample return mission, okay? Yeah, that gets back to this question. The, the, the tennis racket had two sides. There was one side that was used for the comet, and the other side was used for, uh, for uh, interstellar dust. Okay? And um, the question is, why did they have it pointed? Why did they think the interstellar dust would come from one particular direction? And I still don't know the answer, but I'm thinking it has something to do with where the spiral arm of the Milky Way is. But I just made that up. <laughs> I can see there are so many hands going up here that the chances are we'll be here for another couple of hours. Can I suggest that we stop taking questions now here, but Sean will be down here or outside, and we have our other physicists outside. Fundamentally, I'm on my cookie. So if we could thank Sean again for a fantastic talk, and we have questions after. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>